George Johnson, you out there? Hey, John Horganism. <laughs> How are you? Good. I'm just fine. I couldn't resist using your Twitter name. Yeah, um, thank you. And uh, how are you? Uh, <laughs> by, by George Johnson, or no, by, by George? By George Johnson. No, yeah, by, George, to by Johnson. George Johnson. So, yeah, you noticed that I've been sort of very, very tentatively wading in. Yeah, well, you very know. tentatively. And, I, and then I kind of, uh, you know, the wave lapses onto the shore, and I go running back onto the beach to safety. I'm, <laughs> I'm still not sure I like it. Well, yeah, you make it sound so, um, I don't know, it, it, I don't know if it's, uh, I see it as scary so much as just another time waster. <laughs> it, well, overwhelming, yeah, it's not scary, but um, so much of it's really annoying and distasteful. What, what's funny but there's is good things, too. I, I should be positive, and, and I'm going to start by saying what I really like about it is, I mean, it's really true that it's this great way to randomly find out about papers and articles that you might very well not have known about mm -hmm. otherwise. This is as far as a word-of-mouth thing. So, you know, you follow enough people, in my case, fellow journalists and science journalists, and, and I definitely have been directed just you know, to some articles I wouldn't have read otherwise. And that's been really, really good. I really, really like that part. And, yeah. and, and, and I think it's good. You know, and I like, you know, people, you know, saying that they have a new, you know, their, their new, uh, their new uh, blog post and discover or scientific American or wired is, is up now. And, you know, that's, that's a good thing too. And I think that's a great, great use. What really, what really I just find, rather astonishing, and I'm not sure really if I like it or not, but, you know, is uh, th there's just no separation between someone's personal persona and their professional persona. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know in, what you in, mean. In um, many cases. I mean, so I, I, I enjoy, uh, uh, I mean, oh, I, I guess I'll give the example. Uh, <laughs> it was actually pretty... Pretty funny, and I sort of enjoyed it. But it was uh, uh, Carl Zimmer blogging about watching um, watching television with his kids, and it was that show uh, *Ascent of Man* with Jacob Bronowski. And I guess he was watching watching this, you know, reruns of this on television, which is with his you know kids. So they were seeing it for the first time, which is great. And then he was like blogging it in the same way that. You know, like a blogger blogs the uh, presidential debates or blogs um, the, the debut of the new iPhone 5. And, and um, so that was kind of interesting. And then another night I'm looking there, and there's actually, this, this was Ed Young, the, the British science writer who I follow, and uh, David uh, Dobbs, the American science writer, and they were both watching the... Um, is that called, was that called the U.S. Open, that tennis? There is something called the U.S. Race. Open. Yes. Yeah, there was something recently, and it was a big deal, because there was, I think, someone from Scotland was in it. Or yes, something. Andy Murray, who also won the Olympics. Oh, okay. So, you, yeah, you know about this stuff. But I, I didn't. Do. But, but it was, this is just like, you know, I mean, I follow them both because, you know, I get, you know, I learn about things that I wouldn't know otherwise, get directed to interesting articles, see what they're writing. But, you know, this was just like two guys sitting around the living room drinking beer, watching sports together and going back and forth. And, and uh, you know, obviously a lot of fun if you're one of these, if you're, you know, if it were like a small group of people and you could imagine having, having a Twitter, Twitter Super Bowl party among, you know, five or six people. But, you know, it's, there's no channeling, so it goes to everybody who follows you for, for professional reasons. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it just seems very strange. I mean, I guess people like that. But, um, I'm still trying to get my head around the idea of uh, Carl Zimmer watching The Ascent of Man with his kids. <laughs> so when I, when, I watch my ki uh, when I watch anything with my kids, it tends to be spatter movies or, um, mm. you know, super right. violent. Uh, right. Uh, action films and um, uh, well, you know, some of it's high quality, like uh, Dexter or yeah. um, Homeland. Yeah. 
my son and I really got into uh, The Walking Dead. The last thing I would ever want to watch with my kids, and I'm pretty sure they feel the same way, is is uh, a science documentary. Oh, really? Well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, so, well, I, you know, I guess this will be, you know, this is now forever out there in the infosphere to go back and, and read it if you can find it. <laughs> Yeah, well, um, the stuff never goes away, they say. Yeah, well, it's funny because I use I, I tend to use uh, Twitter and Facebook just for professional stuff. Uh, really, nothing, nothing. Yeah, no, I've noticed personal. that. I mean, with your with your Twiku, but these are like comments on on things in the science news. Yeah, so, and, the, but, and this um, interesting, interesting. But you know, I, my science gets uh, you know I try to personalize the science itself. And I, I don't know if you want to segue into uh, some of our topics, but, mm. um, but Good idea. Speak, speaking of, I don't know, the intersection of, of, um, of human nature and science and, and personality and science, I just uh, had a speaker at Stevens that I invited um, oh, yeah, yeah. this week who was one of the great characters I have ever met. This Robert, is Robert Trivers, Robert Trivers yeah. a great evolutionary sure. biologist who yeah. I've, um, you know, I've I've, uh, I've heard about, I've known of for decades, and uh, I met him very briefly at a uh, one of these big evolutionary psychology meetings in I think it was ninety ninety four uh, ninety five somewhere around there. I was oh way back for, in the early yeah. You know, and I, Bob Wright was at this meeting, Richard Dawkins was at this meeting, and um, and then there was this person kind of lurking around the edges, this scruffy-looking, disreputable uh, character. He was actually smoking a joint at one point, um, and, uh, and, uh, and then I asked somebody, who is that guy? And he was wearing this kind of, I don't know, like a hipster kind of African outfit. And I asked somebody who it was, and they said, "Oh, that's that's Robert Trivers." Wow! And uh, and so I actually tried to approach him, and um, he was he was not interested in in uh, in talking to a journalist. Um, and so Robert Trivers, for those who don't know, is one of the Stephen Pinker has actually described him as not just one of the great evolutionary biologists or or scientists, but one of the great thinkers of the 20th century, wow. uh, which, which, you know, it's high praise in, indeed. It, it, I think it's, you can make a case for that because Trivers wrote, he's, he's a classic case of a, a scientist who had this outburst of creativity when he was very young. He was in his 20s. He was a, just still a graduate student at Harvard, and he'd actually just gotten into evolutionary biology um, at a fairly late uh, stage in his education. Oh. And um, he wrote a series of papers that then produced this this huge wave of uh, commentary, analysis, uh, other theories that that um, is still with us today. So yeah. I think his greatest paper is on something called uh, reciprocal altruism, which right. tries to explain why organisms sometimes. Um, sacrifice their own interests to further the interests, not just of um, kin who share their, their genes, right. that can be explained through kin selection, yeah. but uh, to non-related organisms, which yeah. is a real puzzle to explain in um, evolutionary yeah. biology. A classic example of this would be uh, vampire bats. So the, the vampire bats fly out from their bat cave and they go and suck the blood out of a, a cow or, or some animal. And then they come back to the cave, and, and they often share the blood, not just with their offspring, but yeah. if their own offspring have enough to eat, with the offspring of um, in other families mm. as well. Trivers says that, and of course you see this in, in, with humans, things, you know, the classic case would be the Good Samaritan. And Trivers said that, that um, over evolutionary time, uh, if... Uh, people who were compassionate and uh, cared for non-kin, uh, on average, in the aggregate, got some kind of tit-for-tat benefit. So you right. help someone out, 
And then in the future, either your status rises and you get benefits from that because people see, wow, you're, you're really a good person. Or that yeah. the person that you help pays you in, in the future. Um, yeah. Then uh, natural selection will embed this impulse to care for others. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so you're indirectly, it's, it's, it's uh, giving you an advantage as far as survival and, and propagating your genes, right? That's right. And, and one confusion that people often make is that they think that this is a conscious calculation. Oh, yeah, uh, no. Yeah. And it's not. It's it, what the, the uh, ingenuity of natural selection is that it embeds the emotional impulse in us, so we don't have right. to engage in the conscious, conscious calculation right. in the same way that it embeds sexual desire, it embeds lust in our genes, so we're not, we don't have to consciously think, there is a female of my species, if I engage in a somewhat complex physical uh, interaction with her, then yeah. the chances are that I will uh, propagate my my right. uh, genes in this way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's wi wired in on a on a, in, in, in not a consciously accessible level. Right. Uh, but you know, yeah, I was reading your 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 Scientific American you know cross check column on that and on his talk and and uh, yeah, one thing I was wondering is how does this fit in with the um, you know, people like Robert Axelrod and, and game theory and yes. and, uh, and, and and tit for tat and, and prisoner's dilemma and and um, you know cooperating among adversaries. I mean, this, this is all kind of you know part and parcel of the same yes same body of thought, right? I'm not sure. Uh, my guess is that Axelrod uh, was inspired to look into the prisoner's dilemma situation and all these related situations where you're trying to decide whether to trust someone and cooperate or whether to screw them over because you might get some advantage that yeah. way. I think all of that stuff was inspired by um, Trevor's reciprocal altruism. Really? Wow. Uh, I mean, I, I really didn't appreciate that he was at the root in, yeah, um, in the way that you so, described. You know, so you probably know. I think I mentioned in my piece that um, that Dawkins was right. really inspired by Trevor. Oh yeah, the selfish gene and the extended phenotype. Yeah, um, right. And that, that surprised me. I didn't know that. So, so, so Trevor's really predates Dawkins writing the extended phenotype. That's right, and and Trevor's and the selfish gene, of course, was later. Trevor's later. wrote the the preface for the original edition really? of the Selfish Gene. And, really? uh, and then right around that period, um, you had uh, sociobiology. Also yeah, now that's another thing I wanted to ask you. Um, I mean, to me, those are all just kind of mashed up in my mind. E.O. Wilson and sociobiology and, uh, and, tri and uh, Trevor's now and Axelrod and uh, evolutionary psychology. And evolutionary psychology really sort of as a later manifestation of sociobiology, right? Yeah, sociobiology, this, this has to do, the, the nomenclature is all about marketing. So sociobiology, um, I don't think Wilson actually coined the term. I think it predated his book, Sociobiology, but he, he popularized it and wrote this yeah. book that attracted a huge amount of attention. Oh, yeah. It was very controversial and it provoked a backlash from people at uh, at Harvard, especially from Stephen Ooh, Jay yeah. Gould. And Stephen Jay Gould, yeah. Monten. And in part because of that backlash, sociobiology had all these sort of negative associations. Right. And, uh, you know, it was associated with um, conservative politics and people accused it of being like a new form of social Darwinism, which is totally unfair. No, but that's in part, completely... as a result of that... You had people in the 1980s uh, who who were definitely um, sociobiologists, but they coined uh, this new phrase, evolutionary psychology, to apply to the application of, of genetics and evolutionary theory to understanding human behavior. Yeah, which is what a lot of sociobiology was, but this is more, more focused on that particular... Right. Yeah, okay. And plus they probably wanted a new name for PR reasons. Is that yes, definitely. I mean, Gould had actually done a pretty successful job, and it wasn't just Gould, but 
But no. you know, there are a lot of critics of sociobiology. Well, yeah, there's a lot. You know, I, I just really feel pulled in two directions on that. And I know we've talked about this before, but on one hand, it just seems so obvious to me that, um, you know, since, uh, you know, unless you're a, a philosophical, what do they call them, substance dualist, and you believe that the mind is actually some ethereal, something different from the body that's, you know, that um, isn't subject to the laws, laws of, um, you know, the physical laws of science, the laws of science, that unless you believe that, which nobody, you know, really does, I mean, you know, you know some small number of philosophers, but in general, the, the, one of the, you know, the, the running assumptions of neuroscience is that the brain is the mind. The mind, you know, arises, emerges from the brain, but from interactions of, of brain cells and in, in, in a very complex way that you can't, you know, always, you, you can't trace the causality downwards, but uh, you, you can account for the existence of the mind by a purely physical substrate. So if you believe that, and, and then you're going to have to believe, you know, that the brain evolved along with the rest of the body and, 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 and the behavior just like any other part of the, 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 the phenotype, the, you know, the, it, it is, is going to, you know, be sculpted by evolution and with little traits that give you survival instincts. So it seems obvious that sociobiology would be right in evolutionary psychology. And then the other part of me says that once a brain evolves, for whatever reason, you basically you have, you know, the equivalent of this, you know, universal computer, Turing machine inside your head, and you can simulate anything. So you, you become decoupled in a way from your evolutionary roots, and you're able to um, engage in behaviors that are not constrained by your evolutionary history and, and, and thoughts and, yeah, and I, come up with I'm, things like music. I'm ambivalent. You know, I some of my best friends are evolutionary psychologists, and, um, uh, you know, Bob Wright, of course, um, his book, The Moral Animal, mm -hmm. was a, a very important work for popularizing evolutionary psychology and also incorporated a lot of work of Trevor's. This, Trevor's oh, had, yeah. had a lot of work on showing how the uh, genetic differences between um, closely uh, related kin, between parents and their offspring, for example, and between siblings should create a lot of tension within um, families, which, of course, we see. I, I, I see Trivers mm -hmm. as almost like a, kind of our Darwinian version of Freud and showing why families are cauldrons of discontent and, and uh, hostility as well as love and, and cooperation. The, the biggest yeah. problem that I have with evolutionary psychology, and, it's, and, and I, I just have not seen um, – I, I have not seen uh, really good resolutions of this issue. Is how do you distinguish between something that really is a genetic, genetically founded trait? You could even call it an instinct, and something that is learned. So a, a really good example of that would be um, sexual differences between males and females, which evolutionary mm -hmm. psychology has a lot to say about. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the cartoon version is that men are, will, will basically fuck anything. Men are very promiscuous and, um, right. and, you know, we're much less choosy about who we will have sex with. And that's because, um, in principle, we can have an infinite number of offspring. And so we should right. take advantage of that. Whereas women should really be choosy because yeah. they're the ones who have to bear the child with all the risks yeah. attended yeah. with that. For yeah, that's the standard so evolutionary psych, right. evo-psych uh, explanation for that. But here's the problem with that. And, and another corollary of that is that um, men are, are looking in women much more for just sort of physical attractiveness, and, which is associated with fertility, whereas women right. are more concerned with resources, you know, meaning they want to yeah, security, them and have money. Yeah. The problem, so the problem with this, and, you know, to me it's, in a way, it's really plausible, but the problem is women also learn at a very early age. Um, this is something that, that their their rationality uh, tells them, that there are yeah. consequences to casual sex. And, yeah. um, you know, especially before um, 
birth control and before antibiotics yeah. that could get rid of um, yeah. uh, venereal diseases and and uh, but especially before birth control and and so how do you distinguish between something that's supposedly a, a uh, an instinct and something that women learn also in a in a yeah. world in which women generally have many fewer opportunities or paid less and this has certainly been the case um, until very recently and then we can yeah. argue about you know where things stand between the sexes now but women also look at and you know if they have very few opportunities rationally again not because of instinct uh, they it makes sense for them to look for a guy who will be stable and um, and have lots of money instead of a guy who's just yeah. you know strong and good looking yeah so these so these would be historical explanations and, and cultural explanations with all of the contingencies arbitrary contingencies of history but right. I guess you know, if you're really hardcore, you could argue that all of that stuff, like culture, you know, arose from an evolutionary substrate. Sure. You know, the, you know, culture is minds interacting with minds, but the minds are part of the brain which evolved, and that, uh, and that this also even had an effect, you know, along with random random jostlings it had an effect on how history unfolded but you know then it seems like you're getting into that level i was talking about where it just becomes so decoupled from what you can trace back to the substrate that it's like it's almost like floating floating free like the simula simulation level above above the physical substrate level well you know mind and culture and i got i got into some pretty heated arguments Trivers is, like, brilliant. He's really, he's just one of those people, you meet him right away, um, you, you realize you're in the presence of a really big, uh, powerful brain. But what's funny about him is that he also um, is, he talks kind of like a street tough. Oh yeah, let me, let me, I wanted to read this because there was a line in your, in your column that just really jumped out at me that I just loved. Uh, you're, you're describing him at, at your school at Stevens. He says, Trivers is a riveting speaker who prowls around the stage like a predator stalking prey, eyes narrowed, hands stabbing and slicing the air. He riffs and rants like a tough, profane street corner hipster who just happens to have a Nobel caliber scientific brain. <laughs> you know, oh, that was just, that's so vivid. That was really nice. Thank you. He really is a character, and he's, and, one moment he's like really kind of like um, warm and friendly, and he, he calls he he called me kept calling me brother. Although I realize you know he, he calls a lot of people brother, um, brother, you know, like, wow. brother, hey brother, like brother and man. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, then very quickly he can become um, very aggressively. Uh, uh, sort of confrontational. If you say something, you know, it, it, it's it's almost disconcerting. He listens very. He talks a lot himself, but when you talk, yeah. he listens very closely to what you're saying. And if he yeah. senses something wrong with it, he just bores in on it and wow. challenges you to explain what the hell you're talking about. Wow. And and so we ended up having some pretty heated arguments about the one I was going to bring up was Margaret Mead. He has uh -huh. this kind of knee-jerk um, aversion to Margaret Mead. She, he thinks that she's a fraud, that her work in Samoa was proven right. to be fraudulent by this guy, Derek Friedman. Right. I have a completely different take on that. I've looked a lot into it. And yeah. I also, but the more important issue is that Mead was somebody who, you know, she was a, a classic cultural anthropologist and just looking out there at the enormous diversity of human behavior, of, of, um, of human social organization, right. of uh, sexual behavior, of the attitudes of uh, children toward their parents, all these things yeah. that have a profound impact on how we uh, live our lives and, and interact with each other. And yeah. you know, she went to these far-flung places, and I'm sure she got uh, some of the details wrong and that she had some, uh, some things that she was looking for, maybe... <laughs> too eagerly. That's true of everybody. Yeah. Let's face yeah. it. It's true of everybody. It's certainly true of Trivers and the evolutionary psychologists. Uh, but the 
the the body of of uh, Mead's work, the the fundamental theme that humans are very malleable, that we're really right. very conformist. We're creatures of custom and tradition, as well as creatures who are uh, following the programs embedded in our uh, genes. That is just crucial to remember, and it's a big, important counterpoint to the whole evolutionary psychology movement. Right. Right. Sorry, I had to get that off my chest. <laughs> <laughs> But, but Trevor's yeah. was like, he wanted to have, you know, he, he just had decided that, that Mead was like a, like a big bullshit artist, a bad scientist. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, she was just, you know, go, going out to Samoa and then just kind of seeing what she wanted to see and making up, uh, not, you know, maybe not making up, but seeing what she wanted to see and interpreting it in a way that was consistent with her her preconceptions of how she would like human nature to be. That was like the big criticism, right? Yeah, and, and George, you know, you are right that I think because since the invention of culture, you get obviously the whole nature-nurture debate is, um, you know, it, it's extremely complex. And, you know, a lot of people say the debate is over. It's nature and nurture interacting you can't decouple right them. yeah and, and i just don't agree with that because i think it's still important to try to tease out the extent to which something you know this this is why i'm so concerned with um theories of war yeah. it's important to know what the contribution of genes versus culture is for some of these really destructive behaviors yeah. that we have um so we know what what we can do, and even if we can, um, transcend them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, instead of just saying, hey, you know, if this aggression is wired in. and Right. Yeah, you can say, oh, but, you know, there's all these counterexamples. You know, you'd like to think there are counterexamples in these exotic cultures that have been, haven't been exposed to mainstream culture. So, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it's. It's a dilemma. I mean, I was thinking about, you know, in The New Yorker, there was that uh, review by Anthony Gottlieb of this yes. new book by David Barish. And, and Barish, you know, this was a, a book on, on evolutionary psychology by Barish, and, and it was just this really very scathing, also just very, you know, well, well-written written review. And I just, yeah, I just got around to round to reading that and, and and some of his points I hadn't really thought about Gottlieb's that like uh, you know the tendency in, in these evolutionary psychology experiments is to basically say you know that we're uh, you know we're caveman brain you know caveman minds running around in modern bodies and he had some very clever way of putting it it's like uh, you know, our, it's like our, our, our brains in the 21st century are still loaded with apps from uh, Fred Flintstone's uh, smartphone, or not right. Fred Flintstone's not very smartphone. Really nice, yeah. nice line. And and then how do we and, and how do we know that those things that we're you know we're coming up with these ways to explain how certain modern behaviors are consistent with our cave, our upbringing and in, in, uh, as, as cavemen and uh, you know, fighting, fighting each other, other for food and, and, and mates, and or gathering nuts and berries and protecting them from from others, and and, and, and so it all goes back to to uh, Paleolithic, the Paleolithic mind. But how do we know that a lot of this stuff, you know, these apps in the, weren't in the Paleolithic mind from some earlier pre-human era? Right. You know, and are just way down the evolutionary chain, and, um, and and we're doing something that you know might be parallel, but completely unrecognizable. Like you wouldn't really be able to draw this obvious correspondence. So, so you're like making this assumption that it happened during Paleolithic times, because this is when you know culture developed, and you know man, the tool maker, and all of that. And so I thought that was an interesting interesting critique yeah I it you know w what you're saying also reminds me of um, a another problem I think that you have with evolutionary psychology you, you know you mentioned the idea that the the brain is um, 
it, it, it does become kind of like an all-purpose computer. This is something mm. that evolutionary psychologists, some of them, don't like, actually. You know, mm. um, Gottlieb mentions this model of the mind that's come from, I think, uh, Tubi and Cosmides, who are two proselytizers for evolutionary psychology at yeah. uh, UCAL um, Santa Barbara, I guess it is, uh, somewhere in yeah. Southern California. And, um, and, and so they talk about it as like a Swiss Army knife with all these little tools specialized for, um, for uh, different tasks. For, for, yeah, uh, so it's, a, it's a, like these modules, and it's much more, yeah, right. it's, 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 a, it's a grab bag of modules that evolve rather than being like a universal computer where you can simulate anything. But the problem with that is that we obviously do have a, a kind of all-purpose learning and analysis and um, solution-finding program in our brains that is very, very flexible and yeah. adaptable um, and that helped us. Uh, you know, so one of the problems I have with evolutionary psychology is it makes it, the Paleolithic sound like this uniform environment when, of right. course, it was, it was constantly changing and presenting you know, uh, new challenges to our ancestors. Yeah. I mean, you know, you had the, the sudden emergence of, uh, of the Ice Age. You had really dramatic shifts in uh, right. the climate. You had species rising and falling that could provide game or, yeah. or that were predators of humans. Yeah. And... Um, and we had an ability to survive all these challenges, and then we come up with all these extraordinary uh, inventions. We invented science and mathematics and written language and all these sorts of things, again, because we have what I think is an all-purpose um, thinking device. Yeah. And if you accept that, then it, and that might be, again, what contributes to even something that seems to be as hardwired as sexual behavior. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, if you take that to the extreme, you get into the, you know, this whole kind of super optimistic human potential movement stuff, you know, where, you know, we're capable of doing anything. And, and you know, there obviously are constraints. Yeah. You know, just as we're constrained by our bodies, there's going to be some structure to... To the brain, and so I mean, it's not entirely you know working as a you know blank slate Turing machine type simulator. Yes, and it's yeah, it's just all Definitely. yeah, it's just an interesting tension between these two views. You know, I was looking again at Gottlieb's article. It's it's really very very clever. Or his review. He, the title is "It Ain't Necessarily So." Mm -hmm. You know from. Uh, Gershwin's Par Parji and Bess, and of course it refers to Rudyard Kipling's Just So stories, you know, like how the how the leopard got its spot, and these are not used in a you know somewhat derisive way to talk about evolutionary explanations that are just a little too pat. You know, you take some some human behavior, and then you come up with a, a an evolutionary Just So story for um, you know how this came about, even though there's really no way to. I mean, it's plausible, so I, it, it's, it's consistent with the facts as we know them, but um, you can't really go back and rerun the clock and show that that's indeed what happened. Yes, but and, you, can, uh, you can do things like try to look for certain behaviors that are very stable across uh, cultures around the world today and yeah. if you go back in time. And that's yeah. why I think it's, um, it's irrefutable that uh, there is a kind of uh, genetically based language program. This was a huge debate yeah. 60, 70 years ago. Yeah. Language was thought to be something that emerged out of an all-purpose learning uh, device in our brains. Well, that's and, true, yeah. Yeah, and then and, Chomsky came along. and Right, and he showed that, well, I mean, first of all, it's just a fact that language is universal. And yeah. as far back as you go in time, you can yeah. also see evidence of uh, language from the from the very early stages of our our species, and then you also also find common structural elements in in right. all languages. Uh, you know, yeah, I mean, you know, he's, he, 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 you know, this is. I mean, I just have to take that on faith, you know, because he, you know, this this is this is Chomsky's 
you know, big thing and, and, you know, huge school of linguistics that supports it and people doing all the studies. And, but it's really a remarkable thought to think, I mean, you know, a structure so deep that, um, you know, it, it, it could connect, you know, English and, and, and Swahili or, or, or any random, um, you know, one of the hundreds of different languages and dialects that you could pick on, on the Indian subcontinent. And, mm -hmm. And you know, with completely different historical historical roots, you know, past a certain very early early proto language, and and uh, you know, there's that famous line from Chomsky that uh, that if if a Martian came to Earth, um, he would think that we're all speaking the same language. Right. <laughs> hey, I, I just I, that just blows I, my mind. Yeah, there's another, there's another like mad genius, uh, Chomsky. <laughs> yeah. I'd love to see Chomsky and Trivers in a room together. Um, I, I'd like a, I, I'd like to try to create a segue to something that that I know yeah. you want to talk about. The main, um, the theme of uh, Trivers' talk was the theme of this recent book that I reviewed for the Times back in December. It's called The right. Body of Fuel. The oh, yeah, you referred food. to him smoking pot in your book review. Yes. Yeah, you told and, that story about seeing him. <laughs> and the reason I could do that is because, I mean, I never would have done it, except that he talks about his pot smoking in his uh, book. He oh, that's right. Pot. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, wasn't, it wasn't just this gratuitous right. detail. Yeah. And by the way, <laughs> Trivers has also spoken publicly about the fact that he is uh, bipolar, um, and mm. so I mentioned it in my review as well, and it yeah. helps to explain why he's not better known, uh, because um, he has, you know, he's he's had some difficult episodes in his in his life that I think contributed to his leaving Harvard, for example, in mm. the late 1970s. Even though obviously he was uh, already a superstar in oh. biology. But anyway, the, yeah. the what I, I wanted to uh, the point I wanted to make is that Trippers has always really been concerned with deceit, with lies. With oh yeah, 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 and self deception. I, yes, in the animal kingdom, and even when it comes to humans, I don't know if there's any animal analog for this, but self deception, which is a really weird, complicated uh, problem with all sorts of strange implications for our understanding of the self, uh, he has a, a, a sort of quick and dirty evolutionary explanation for self-deception that, you know, that the, um, the, the reasons why deception would evolve are fairly obvious, that, that uh, if we can fool people, uh, potential mates, rivals, even friends, um, we can get various advantages out of that. Uh, yeah. But lying is actually especially lie, complex lies for humans require a lot of men or mental energy and, yeah. and it often manifests itself in various, um, in various ways, uh, stresses on the voice, changes in the musculature of, uh, of the, uh, the face. And, and so people can, can detect lying as well. We, there's sort of been this arms right. race among humans of, of, Line become more sophisticated, becoming more sophisticated, and detection of line. So self deceit, according to Trivers, uh, the logic behind that is that if you believe your own lies, you're a more effective liar. Yeah, yeah, that's a very striking idea. Yeah. Yeah, so you're believing your own lies, so then you're not going to have these physical manifestations of like you know quickened pulse and and. Uh, and galvanic skin response, and the things that show up on lie detectors, but also are subliminally picked up by by other people, just in these subtle little body clues. And and if you think about it, I mean, some of this is almost approaches the level of truisms that if you if your self deceptions are all sort of in a positive direction. In other words, if you think that you're smarter and sexier and um, a better leader than you really are. That actually can be sort of a self-fulfilling uh, idea. Yeah. So you come on if you're a guy, you're trying to seduce some women, 
um, if you are extremely confident with her, that actually improves your prospects of um, reproductive uh, success, um, <laughs> shall we say. So it's an evolutionary explanation for Norman Vincent Peale's power of positive <laughs> thinking. Yeah, and it, you know, one thing that's disturbing about people in politics is that it almost seems as though self-confidence and belief in yourself, in spite of all contrary evidence, is maybe the single most important factor for success in politics, even more than intelligence. And oh, even more God, than yes. Decency. I mean, <laughs> I, I, it's, it's really remarkable, you know, if you, whenever... It happens like you meet a United States senator in real yeah. person. Yeah. Man, most right. of them, or, or a lot of them, these are big, formidable, intimidating people. Yeah. A lot of them, again, I know, I mean, there are exceptions. Um, yeah, so this has to make you think of the, of the presidential debate, right? Well, actually, uh, we could get into that. I was seeing this as a segue <laughs> into uh, uh, fraud, uh, either outright fraud or confirmation bias. Um, oh, yeah. Either self-deception so. or, or outright deception in science, which I think is emerging as a problem much, much bigger than uh, anybody might have realized, let's say, 10, 20 years ago. Yeah, I mean, the self-deception angle is really interesting. Yeah. You know, when you, yeah, and, and, and yeah, and, and then confirmation, and that would fit in with confirmation bias because you would be looking too hard. Are, are you still there? George? Are you still there? <coughs> yeah. Hello? Oh, good. <laughs> uh, okay. I had another phone hand. Yeah, I was afraid that would happen. Yeah. I got, yeah, just, just uh, you know, for people who are watching us the last two times, my battery seems to last precisely 40 minutes, and, and um, that's the only phone I have that I can plug a headset into. I need to get some newer technology here. So. <laughs> yeah, confirmation bias. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, Which is um, what, you know, there's, there's been a ton of, uh, discussion of that recently. It's a big topic in the uh, in thinking fast, thinking slow. The uh, the the big bestseller by uh, the Nobel Prize winner uh, Kahneman. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's and unfortunately, this this evidence of confirmation bias even in science, which is yeah. is is a process designed to root out deception. And right. deception. Yeah. Um, but then you're saying that, yeah, so, so self deception feeds into that because you really believe that, you know, like if you're picking and choosing, you're picking and choosing your best, what really is your best data, and not just because it confirms your thesis, but because, right. you know, you're using your instinct as a, as a scientist to know, you know, what's, what's a good laboratory run, what's a bad laboratory run, and then, um, and then it's not really a matter of, of outright or deliberate fraud, but a matter of deceiving yourself in this way that the Trivers was talking about, and might have evolutionary roots. Mm -hmm. So, so, so evolutionary psychological psychological roots to scientific fraud. Wow. Right. Um, That's no, an interesting. I, it, yeah, I love it when science uh, looks in the mirror. You know, science turns yeah. its attention on it on itself. Um, and uh, there's a lot of that going on right now, and and this is related. I know that you've been writing about or or, or uh, thinking um, about some cases of some bad oh. science being popularized, and and I just wanted to mention yeah. as a kind of backdrop of this, there's a oh, big oh thanks yeah yeah there's a big new study that uh, suggests that. Um, that many more papers are being retracted uh, now than have been in the past, and that it had been thought that these bad papers were results of confirmation bias and uh, and uh, sort of in innocent mistakes. Now it looks right. like a lot of them um, were the result of deliberate misconduct, according to a... Oh, uh, right, right, right. Yeah, that's that, that article that Z yeah, Zimmer was writing about that in, in the Times, that same study. Right. 
Yeah, yeah. So that goes against it being being um, in, in, in innocent, you know, with uh, nefar you know, actually deliberate. They're saying. Right. Yeah. Uh, so it says that um, I think a misconduct was the reason for three quarters of uh, the retractions in. Um, yeah. in a group of more than 2,000 retracted papers, if they could pinpoint any reason for the re retraction. Yeah, and, and, and uh, when they're saying misconduct, this is, uh, you know, this is not equal fraud. I mean, fraud is a subset, right? I so misconduct guess, includes deliberate I, fraud, but it also includes, in, includes other things. Um, okay, I'm looking, yeah, they use the word uh, misconduct. Let me see. Where... Because there were two different percentages they gave. It was something like 40% fraud, 75% misconduct, with fraud being a subset of misconduct. But I can't remember what the other misconduct was. Okay, what's, Pla what's, what's, oh, it included things like plagiarism and, and oh, I see. You know, right. you know, things like that that you know isn't like fraud as we usually think of it, where you're you know you're, you're saying that you're you know you're, you're you're like throwing out bad data because you know it's going to uh, uh, undermine your your hypothesis, which you know in your heart of hearts is true. And, right. I mean, these things have gone. I mean, you know, I'm sure even the ones that you know that, that you could say are, are deliberate and use that word. I mean, it's there's all these layers of subtlety where self deception comes into into play. Yeah. Um, like I, who's the Harvard uh, M M Mark? Uh, you know, the, 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 there was the recent thing with his monkey study. Oh, Mark Hauser and, at uh, Yeah, Hauser, Harvard. right. Another yeah, evolutionary right. psychologist. An evolutionary psychologist, yeah. And, uh, you, know, you, read the, you know, you read the details of, of, of the, um, you know, the problems with some of his, his studies that were just being taken as, you know, gospel truth at that point because they well, were considered see, rock George, solid. One of, the, and, one of the reasons why I think this is really becoming a, a gigantic emerging problem for science uh, and at some point not just for journalists like us but but um, for science um, in its and its relationship with the public with you know mm -hmm. people who are uh, in in many cases putting up their tax dollars to support science no. You've, I, I think we've talked on this show about um, research being done by a guy named John Ioannidis, a Greek, Greek yeah, epidemiologist, yeah, right, who's now right. at Stanford, pointing out that, arguing that more than half of uh, all peer-reviewed published papers are wrong in some fairly significant um, yeah, way. And yeah. he attributes that to this very competitive uh, process, competition both among scientists who come up with exciting results and competition among science journalists to publish the most exciting right. results and that this results in um, you know it's kind of it's kind of a, a technical a special version of the same phenomenon that leads all journalists to go with sensational reports that uh, turn out to be greatly exaggerated. Well, you're looking for a good yeah. story, but 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 the sensational reports already there. So Right. But 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 maybe, you know, the the problem is not being critical enough or just remembering that this is one study. I mean, you know, good journalists put these in context and part of it's just you know, human nature, the readers are going to you, you could give them 10 stories and they're going to seize on and remember the one that seems, you know, to be the most interesting interesting story, which may not be the one that uh, lasts. And Well, yeah, I mean, my, my examples recently that I wrote about in, in, in the Cancer Chronicles, which is this, this, um, this blog I've just been kind of wading back into. You know, it's keyed to my book, The Cancer Chronicles, which mm -hmm. I just delivered the manuscript this week, which was a good feeling. Oh, After right. Two and a half years, <laughs> yeah. But, good for um, you. Thanks, um, but you must yeah, be, you yeah. an endorphin high. No, nah, you know, as soon as I delivered it, I started. Actually, what I did was interesting. I, I decided to get get one of these Kindle things. Yeah, I got one. Yeah, I know. <laughs> That's part of what inspired me. Your your Joycean riffs on your Kindle, but um, 
I, I decided to, I, I also found, I, I wanted to have the experience of reading my manuscript so it felt more like I was reading a book to try to find things that were, you know, not working. Uh -huh. And I found the software where you can, like, convert a word processing file into um, uh, an ebook file for a Kindle or an iPad, you know, complete with uh, clickable, clickable chapter links in the table of contents. And, uh -huh. and, and it does it pretty quickly. So I, I decided I, I was, you know, for this last or, you know, there'll probably be several more reads of my book all the way through. I wanted to get away from my computer and, you know, read it in bed and, and you know, and, and just the way I would be reading, reading um, a book that I had actually gone out and purchased or borrowed. Um, and then as soon as I did this, of course, all these things start jumping out at me, and I'm using the Kindle highlighting thing, and then going back and making changes in my manuscript. So not on the endorphin high yet. It's gonna, you know. Oh, well. Well, you're a perfectionist, I'm sure, George. <laughs> you're, you know, your idea of a first draft is what most of us hacks would consider a beautifully polished gem <laughs> of prose. Oh, no, no. I mean, it's shocking that you can read something you've been working on two and a half years. You've read it over finally, sentence by sentence. So many times you read it over with friends, other people, colleagues, scientists have read it. And, you know, it's not you're finding errors so much, but, like, you'll have this really clumsy rep repetition of... Of maybe a, of the same phrase within a paragraph, and mm -hmm. and the kind of thing you know that you should have smoothed out by now, and you've just read over it. So I f I'm finding these things sort of jump out at me by reading it in this different format that maybe they wouldn't otherwise. It's just like when you print it out and read it on paper, you see things you don't see on the screen, and then when it's typeset in a different font with a you know, different registration, and you get the printed galleys back, you read that, and then you see things. And, but anyway, that's kind of a diversion from so I, so the Cancer Chronicles. And it just struck me, I, we, we talked about the first one a month ago, and it was, uh, God, it can already be a month, uh, the, um, the ENCODE project. And, yeah. And, you know, in some criticisms over how that was presented in the press, but the press was presenting really exactly the spin that it was given by by the main authors of, of the main paper in the study. There were many papers, but the primary paper, and it was the spin that was being promoted by journal, the journal Nature, which put up this huge extravaganza multimedia website. You know, and I was just struck by the difference between that and when Watson and Crick published uh, their paper on the structure of deoxyrubinucleic acid and 1953, you know, it's just one paper, you know, a little, you know, fanfare, and, I'm, you know, obviously there wasn't a website for the paper. Now there would be a website, and they would have videos, and they'd have, they'd probably have a video of, um, of Crick and Watson at the Eagle Tavern in Cambridge, you know. <laughs> hoisting a couple of pines and crick saying, we've, we've <laughs> discovered the secret of life. It would have been great to get that on film, yeah, yeah. like 16 millimeter. But anyway, so you know, I was just struck by this extravaganza that surrounded this paper and how this was just all went kind of directly into the way it was reported in the press. And, of course, if it hadn't been, the people would have said, oh, you misreported our paper, and and it left people thinking, like your average person who, you know, average person who follows the science news and finds this stuff interesting, huge numbers of people now, probably millions, are under the impression that for years and years, scientists thought that like 99, 98% of the genome was junk, and now there's this new study that's come out called ENCODE, and now we know, wow, they were wrong all this time, you know, that's right. actually... You know, the eighty um, percent of the junk DNA is functional, and you know we talked about this last time. It got into this really interestingly weird semantic dispute over how you define functional, in which in which it seemed to me that there was very little that wouldn't be functional, and it goes against you know the whole evolutionary explanation of the genome. There has to be a lot of junk, and a lot of the junk is going to be put to use in an opportunistic kind of way. But uh, but still, so all these people now, you know, they, all, none of that was in the in the press coverage, and 
you know, there was that one good, I, th I think I mentioned, it's this really excellent post-mortem by this guy, John Timmer, in Ars Technica. Yeah. God, I mean, nothing in mainstream press came close to being being that good. And so anyway, that was one thing. There were actually three different instances. And then there was the other thing where, you know, I think huge people, you know, reading the science news that uh, don't know, you know, they don't have, that they or not anyone close to them has had breast cancer, are now thinking, wow, they've made this really interesting discovery that there's not just one type of breast cancer, but there's four. And so I wrote a column about that that I'll link to. I mean, and I read these, this page, these news reports, and I thought, wait, what are you talking about? We've known there are four categories for a long, long time. And, uh, and at first I was confused because, you know, well, I think of the four kinds of breast cancer as, you know, there's estrogen positive, androgen positive, uh, HER2 positive, and, you know, and those all refer to the, the cells overexpressing or, or they're manufacturing more of these little receptors, these little molecular antennae on the surface of the cells than the others, and therefore they're more they're more uh, vulnerable to certain kinds of treatments, you know, like withholding estrogen for estrogen receptor. And then there's a fourth kind called triple negative, which just means none of the, none of the above, which is bad because then you, there's not not the obvious treatment. So, but it actually turns out that these are more these are different categories that were defined by um, you know, more more by molecular signature. So at first I thought, oh well, that's the so they have they're just kind of cutting the joints, carving up the joints differently. And there's four new new uh, types of breast cancer are, are now known that weren't known the day before or before the experiments. But then I went back and looked at the four, and you know, I went back and looked in some papers, and I you know all got all the way back to 2000 and found the same four terms were already being talked about as the four, you know, different molecular types. Yeah. Some genetic before, but molecular types of breast cancer. So this wasn't new. And then you had to go back to the paper and and the press release from um, was this Science or Nature? I think it was Science. I I don't know for sure, but someone you know, if they care, they'll check it. And I and I linked to it, I think, in my um, my post. But you go back to the press release, and it was kind of ambiguous. They, they talked about confirming that there were four different types, and that made me think, oh, well. Um, yeah, you know, and actually Paul Rayburn brought this up on the Night Science Journalism Tracker, you know, this really great website that critiques science views, that it sounded like they were confirming this and that they already existed. But then I went back to the paper itself and the way they described it in the paper, and certainly in the abstract, it sounds like they're saying that they established it, but they didn't right. actually mean that, and it was misunderstood. And so, again, now all these people think something's false, and it's, again, not entirely or largely the fault of the journalists. But, of course, it's easy to say in retrospect they should have been, been more skeptical. And then the third thing, of course, was this bit re more recent, this French uh, genetic modified food study that, um, that purported to show that these mice that were being fed this genetically altered corn um, were developing a significant number of tumors. And in that case, you know, the big scandal was the way the scientists presented it. I mean, at first, apparently, they were already known for, you know, being very politically supportive of the anti-genetically modified food movement. And, and the way they presented bias. it was, yeah, a confirmation bias for one thing. And then the way they presented it to the press is they said, you know, it's you know, typical to have an embargo. You can't write about this until the paper appears, and the journals are the ones that enforce that. But this embargo was not only could they not write about or, or run their stories, they couldn't talk to anyone else about the paper to ask them their opinions of it. So they weren't able to get any contrary opinions. So the first reports, in a, in a shocking number of um, journalists, accepted these conditions wrote the story entirely based on the people who are promoting their own study without getting any skeptical voices. You know, Carl Zimmer wrote a really scathing, scathing um, post on, on his blog, The Loom, about that. I and, you know, that. the result, again, all these people read this and um, have this idea now that there's really a solid study showing that uh, genetically modified food causes tumors, and there's all kinds of problems 
with the study, you know, that they had a very small number of mice, a very small control group. These were mice that are bred to be particularly tumor prone. Mm -hmm. And um, and, and, it's, and, and this was it just, again, you know, the journalist shouldn't have accepted the conditions under which it was released, but still by getting the head start on that first story, you know, that's what so many people are going to believe. Listen, I, I actually have to, I real, my children have been trying to reach me in the last hour, so I, I have to get off oh. pretty soon, but I wanted to bring up <laughs> oh, something. Oh, we've run, no, we've run just over an hour. Yeah, um, I just wanted to mention one thing that's related to what you've just been talking about. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. sorry. I think in some ways it's, so it's even more serious. This actually was something that I clipped from uh, last spring that, that uh, you might have seen. It was a study um, of some major publications um, on cancer, and uh, there was a study to try to replicate these, um, these initial um, claims, and yeah. 47 out of the 53 papers, the, uh, the results reported in the papers could not be replicated. Wow. Remember that? It was reported in Nature. Yeah, um, yeah, I'd was, forgotten. And it was, it really sort of made people you know, it's of a piece with all these other things that we've been talking about, and especially yeah. the possibility of confirmation bias and and even uh, fraud throughout the, the scientific literature. So that's, you know, 47 out of 53. And then I'm reading a piece by um, Sharon Begley on this, actually. Mm -hmm. And Begley mentions that, a, uh, that there's a committee of the National Academy of Sciences that heard testimony that the number of scientific papers that had to be retracted increased more than tenfold, tenfold. Over, the, over the last uh, decade. And that's Whoa. not just because the, um, there are more papers being generated. The number of journal articles only rose by 44%. Oh, okay. And the number okay. of retractions rose by, um, by, uh, by tenfold. Yeah. So um, it's really a serious problem. I mean... Yeah. Uh, and, and you think a lot of it's just the boiler, you know, the boiler room kind of pressure of getting this stuff out and having to get I, the grants, justify the grants, and I then, do. of course, you add in the complications of, you know, for anyone, you know, uh, one thing that's really struck me is you start re looking into cancer science and how many of the big names are, are, are um, involved with some kind of startup company helping to develop some targeted therapy that, you know, marginally improves. I mean, they hope it does better than marginally improve survival times, but enough to get uh, FDA approval and get, you know, snapped up by, by Genentech for $100 million or something. And well, Ioannidis has said that there's a correlation between the competitiveness of a field and, and also the financial stakes. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and then the, um, the, the, uh, erroneousness of the data being, uh, being reported, you know, that's... Oh, well, yeah, that's interesting. So are, are, are people breaking down what fields have the, the highest percentage of, of, of retractions? And you'd sort of think it would it would be medical medical sciences. Medical yeah. and also uh, solid-state physics, I think, Ioannidis reported. Solid-state uh, physics. Has, led, has had a lot of uh, retractions and some and some major scandals, too. Listen, George, I... I'm, I um, yeah, you yeah, got to I have to get off now. <laughs> it's okay. I mean, it's, a, it's an hour, hour plus. <laughs> so great talking to you again. <clears throat> oh, by the way, we should tell people that, that we will be appearing on, um, I guess, the first week of each month from now on, and the name of our show is going to be Science Faction. Right? Oh, yes, that's right, Science Faction. Science and Faction. Next time we can talk about what that means and what it doesn't mean and yeah. And, and the source of the name and that interesting column that you wrote. Sounds good. Okay, John. All right. Talk to you soon, George. Have a good weekend. You too.